Darjeeling is a mountainous region in eastern India that's famous for its tea production. This tea differs from a typical Indian black tea, and today we're going to learn why that is. We're also going to be comparing a new style of brewing with our typical Kyusu brewing. Let's get started. Okay, so what we have here is a Darjeeling black tea. Um, this is probably the most famous of all the teas coming from India, um, and it has a very unique flavor to it um, because of a, a number of different factors. Um, the primary reason this is such a unique tea for the subcontinent is because it's made using um, the Chinese variety uh, of Camellia sinensis plant rather than the Asamica variety. So instead of using the native um, Indian tea plant, they're using the tea plant that was imported from China. So the flavor is very different when compared to um, other types of Indian black teas like Asamica, for example. So um, what we're actually going to be doing is something a little bit different. We're going to be using a Gaiwan to brew this tea. Um, and this is something I've been doing now for maybe about two years, so I'm still learning. I'm much more familiar with the, the Japanese green teas, but I kind of wanted to um, you know, expand this channel a little bit and talk about some other types of teas that people have been really curious about. And uh, Darjeeling is one of those. So um, before we get started, let's just kind of compare this uh, versus our Kyusu teapot. So um, one of them is made from porcelain, the other one is made from clay, specifically tokonami clay. Um, so this black Kyusu teapot is, um, is made from clay coming from Tokonami, Japan, which is kind of the um, de facto capital of um, clay pottery production in Japan. And um, one of the things you'll notice, I mean, the first thing you'll notice is definitely the size difference between these two um, brewing vessels. The other one is that, you know, obviously this is porcelain, so it's, it's very smooth, um, very neutral, whereas this kind of has a little bit of a matte finish to it. So this is slightly unfinished clay, um, and that's going to lead to some, some small differences in the, in the brewing of the tea. Um, you know, this has kind of more of like a, a porous consistency, so that's actually going to interact with the tea directly as it's brewing, and this one is more um, of a you know, smooth, glazed, so there's, there's much more neutrality. If you want this same effect in a Kyusu teapot, you can go for the glazed Kyusu teapot, um, which is going to be kind of your all-purpose Japanese teapot. But if you really want to drill down on one specific tea type, um, some people swear by the um, slightly unglazed or completely unglazed teapot because you're really going to enhance some of the, the tasting aspects of the tea, but you're also going to be able to season it over time. So, you know, kind of like a skillet, you're kind of seasoning um, every time you use it and then it's kind of enhancing some of these flavors adding complexity to the flavors um, but if you're kind of new to tea then we recommend going for the glazed red teapot the most notable difference between these two types of brewing vessels is the filtration so as you can see here there's a built-in clay filter and uh, what that does essentially is um, as you're pouring out the tea it just catches the leaves so they don't end up in your cup so this is kind of um, I, I would almost call this like automatic filtration, whereas this is more manual filtration. And so what this is, obviously you don't see any filtration here. You don't see any built-in clay filters or anything like that. You actually create the filtration by, um, you know, creating a gap by making this slightly off center. Um, so if you pour like this, no water's gonna come out, but if you pour like this, some water's gonna come out, but the leaves aren't gonna come out. Um, so we're going to be demonstrating that in a second, but first let's take a look at these leaves. If you're used to these Japanese sencha teas, um, these leaves are going to be very large by comparison. So these are much larger pickings um, from the tea plant, and um, this makes it suitable for brewing in the Gaiwan, whereas I'm of the opinion that um, you know these smaller leaf Japanese sencha teas very, very difficult to brew in the Gaiwan because you have to set the, the gap so small. Um, but that's definitely a topic for another video. These leaves are completely dry. You're not going to get a whole lot of aroma off of them. But one of the things you can do is just preheat your teaware, kind of get that warm. And then we're going to kind of wake up these leaves gently. So I'm just preheating um, this Gaiwan here. I'm just going to pour the water off screen, and so now I have a slightly uh, slightly damp, very warm uh, gaiwan here. And then when I put these leaves in, I'm 
just kind of like a subtle way to wake up the leaves and kind of start to get the first that first hit of aromatics off of them. Mm. A lot of dark jams in the aroma of the leaves. Slightly alcoholic, I would say. It's very rich, very jammy, very sweet. Really nice aroma. Let's go ahead and go for the first brewing. So, as you can see, I have a very small brewing vessel and a lot of leaves, so I'm almost just filling in the spaces, spaces with water here. Um, but the brewing time, to compensate for that, the brewing time is going to be very short. Just make sure everything's submerged here. And then, you know, pour it out. Roughly 10 second brewing. And as you can see, I have one leaf that kind of pinched right there and uh, one leaf actually ended up inside the cup, so it's not a perfect, um, not a perfect exact science, um, but it works pretty well. Um, so now we have, you know, very uh, completely submerged leaves. The aroma is a little bit more, a little bit more fruity, not as heavy, not as alcoholic as the, the first aroma of the leaves. It's still very nice, very fruity. So far, it's a very, very fruity tea. First brewing. You can see it's very light, even though this is a black tea, uh, which is normally known for having like a reddish color. Um, the color is basically golden yellow. Starting to get that first hit of, you know, mostly aromatics, mostly kind of this floral, kind of geranium aroma and taste characteristic. A little bit of the fruit is coming out, but it's it's very very thin right now because this first brewing you're kind of stripping away layers of flavor from the leaves so the first brewing you're you're actually with Japanese teas when we do that one minute brewing we're getting um, kind of like the, the strongest aspect of the tea whereas it's much different here when you're doing these short brewings the first brewing is actually very light because you're only doing five ten seconds um, the second one I'm gonna be doing 15 seconds I'm just kind of stripping off some of the more aromatic layers of the tea, and then later on we're going to get more into the body. So you may find that the third and fourth steeping is where the tea really comes alive when you're using this method. Again, using that manual filtration, you know, setting a, a gap with my fingers here. Maybe not the best technique, but it works with two fingers on each side of the lid and then one on that top button here. Oh wow. It's really coming alive with some of these, I'm starting to see some of these more peachy notes, which I normally get with these um, Darjeeling black teas. Um, definitely a, a crisp bitterness with the finish. You see the color's getting a little bit darker, but still very light certainly for a black tea. Mm. Starting to get a little bit of this um, spiciness, kind of this cinnamon spiciness. They refer to that as muscatel, which is kind of the, uh, the trademark flavor of this tea, is that, that kind of, um, you know, almost dark spiciness, like, uh, like you might get in like a, like a cooked pastry or something like that, um, or like something with, you know, cinnamon. It's difficult to explain what this muscatel flavor really is, but it's kind of this, um, you know, sweet, um, sweet, spicy flavor. So for the third brewing, I'm going to be using 20 seconds. And hopefully now we're going to just start getting into the body of the tea. So this is usually my favorite when I use this method. My favorite is the, the third brewing. And uh, we'll see if we can wake up some of those, some of those more fruity notes. Maybe um, get more into the spiciness of the tea. So you see the colors maybe more or less the same, maybe a, a little bit darker. Mm. Yeah. Now we're really getting into it really starting to get this peach flavor. A um, little bit more of these jams, less of the floral notes. But 
The finish is spicy, cinnamony, a little bit bitter. Very, very nice. Definitely the best, best brewing so far. Because now you're kind of, you've just stripped away kind of the, um, I'll go ahead and show you here. You've just kind of started to strip away the, the outer aromatics of the leaf and now you're really getting into the body of the tea. Um, you can see, you know, the leaves are, I would say half opened up, definitely have some room to expand, but you know, you, you've kind of gotten, gotten through that initial, that initial layer of the tea. Mm. Very good. The fourth steeping is also known for being good. So this one, I'm adding five seconds every time in case you didn't know. Um, so because we're kind of stripping off a little bit of a flavor layer every time. Um, I'm just increasing the length of the brewing each time. So first was 10, then it was 15, then 20. Um, now I'm going to go for 25 and uh, see what we can see in the fourth brewing. So, so far, um, very sweet, very jammy, you know, kind of like this, this cooked down sweetness that you might get from a jam or like a compote. Very concentrated, heavy, cooked sweetness. Um, and then some spiciness in the finish and a little bit of bitterness to kind of round it out. Definitely the most, uh, definitely the strongest flavor. Not necessarily my favorite because the last one I think was still better. Um, what you're going to start to see here now is, you know, I keep talking about getting into the body of the tea. You know, we, we've kind of stripped away some of these higher notes, like the aromatics, the fruitiness, um, the sweetness in some cases, and now we're kind of getting more into that the bitterness, the earthiness of the tea. Um, so it's going to have more raw flavor, but it may not be quite as enjoyable because you're not getting um, this kind of complex assortment of uh, tasting notes like you were in the third or even the second. Tea's still very good, though. Definitely getting some type of jam. I'm trying to put my finger on it. Maybe more like a darker jam, like a blackberry jam or something. And when I'm talking about the fruity notes in these teas, it's not that this tea has uh, has fruit in it. It's just that the um, the characteristics in this leaf also exist in other types of plants that we're familiar with. So um, these kind of uh, volatile compounds, hexanol hexanol and linalool, things like that that kind of give tea its flavor and aroma, its complex flavor and aroma, um, also exist in other types of plants and, you know, flavors that you might be familiar with, like different fruits and um, even things like hops, for example. Um, all these kind of share different compounds with the tea plant, and um, so when you're tasting a tea, you might uh, come across a flavor that you recognize from other other drinks or other foods, and that's that's what makes tea so interesting is that it's so complex with these these different tasting notes. Let's go ahead and do one more brewing, but I think this flavor is kind of on the decline. We'll go for the, the full thirty seconds and really kind of um, extract kind of as much as we can from these from these leaves here. It's kind of, uh, this fruity flavor is actually making a bit of a resurgence, um, but still taste is kind of overwhelmed by this, this bitterness, this slightly, um, slightly uh, spicy cinnamon flavor. Um, still very nice, but you know, definitely not as complex as the earlier brewings we saw. Um, so you can continue to brew this tea, you know, four or five more times, or at least until it loses flavor. Um, you're getting, you know, a tiny bit of liquid each time, but you're kind of, enjoying the flavor over multiple steepings. So I still kind of prefer this um, style of Japanese tea brewing where you get, you know, one super sweet infusion, then you get one um, more powerful kind of steamed vegetable infusion, um, and you get kind of three completely different cups of tea from the three different brewings. But this is also, if you really want to get to know a tea, and it's a, you know, a black tea or an oolong or a pour, um, this is a really good way to do it because you're really getting to know the tea in a lot of different angles. So it's almost like looking at the tea through different lenses, different angles, different lighting, 
um, you get to see all the different aspects. So like the aromatics, the fruitiness, but also then you get into the, the body and the character of the tea. Um, so definitely worth doing. In a future video, I'd like to try this method with a Japanese tea and see, see uh, how it kind of differs from the more traditional um, Kyusu brewing. Um, but for now, I think this was a, a good discussion on uh, Darjeeling black tea, something that a lot of people have been curious about, so I'm happy to finally do a video about it. Um, if you have any other suggestions for videos we can do in the future, please leave them in the comments below, and um, hopefully we can um, turn it into a, a nice kind of exploration of that tea. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, you can leave those in the comments, but uh, until then, we'll see you next time.